Welcome. I'm very excited to be recording this lecture in particular. I've spent a number of weeks writing, researching, and gathering as much information as possible to make it as interesting and relevant to you and to our studies as possible. I hope you enjoy it as much as I. And a reminder that while I often cite authors and journal articles within the context of the recorded lecture, please know that with this, as well as with all my lectures, a full bibliography and all citations are freely available upon request. Please find my contact information in my profile. As is usual in our class, as you may remember, each one of our lectures results in a seminar question. The seminar question is intended to be an exercise, culminating the lecture, the textbook reading, and any supplemental reading or research that we might conduct. For today's lecture, The Historical Evolution of the Nation, Nationalism, and Nation State, we're looking at a seminar question that asks you to please choose one of the several eras described in either the lecture or your textbook. Please describe that era's contribution to the evolution of the nation state. And so it doesn't matter which of the eras you'd like to choose because they all have elements of contributing to the evolution of the nation state, whether it's the Athenian Air Empire, the Roman Empire, the three empires of the Middle Age, Machiavelli and the Italian city-states, the rise of the Titans, Richelieu and raison d'etat, the age of Napoleon, culminating in the Peace of Westphalia. How about the Treaty of Versailles of 1919? You're welcome to consider post-World War II and the birth of the Cold War era, or yet better yet, looking at the fall of the Soviet Union, how about the nascent nation states, former Soviet bloc republics that now have the challenge of nation building in the post-Cold War era? Any of these eras are fine to examine. What I'm asking you to do is to introduce your topic by introducing the seminar question. And if you're describing the evolution of the nation state, I would imagine that one of your first jobs in your essay would be to define the nation state. And so at the end of today's lecture, as you may note, we will be talking about the theoretical evolution of the nation state, what aspects belong in the nation state, and subsequently, how those aspects then evolved through these eras or in each of these individual eras. So my friends, that is our seminar question for today. And I encourage you to think deeply about it while you're listening to this lecture. And perhaps while you're just driving around town or washing the dishes, let it percolate into your mind and deeply consider what some of the elements of the nation state are, what the elements of the era under examination is, and how the two meet. Oh, I look forward to reading your essays. The concept of a nation state is notoriously difficult to define. Anthony Smith, one of the most influential scholars of nation states and of nationalism, argued that a state is a nation state only if and when a single ethnic and cultural population inhabits the boundaries of a state, and that the boundaries of that state are coextensive with the boundaries of that ethnic and cultural population. Now, this is a very narrow definition that presumes the existence of the one nation, one state model. Consequently, less than 10% of states in the world would meet this criteria. The most obvious deviation from this largely ideal model is the presence of minorities especially ethnic minorities, which ethnic and cultural nationalities exclude from the majority nation. The most illustrative example here would be groups that have been specifically singled out as outsiders historically, such as the Roma and the Jews in Europe. According to a wider working definition, a nation state is a type of state that conjoins the political entity of a state to the cultural entity of a nation from which it aims to derive its political legitimacy to rule 
and potentially its status as a sovereign state if one accepts the declarative theory of statehood as opposed to the constitutive theory. We'll touch on these in a second. A state is specifically a political and geopolitical entity, while a nation is a cultural and ethnic one. The term nation-state implies that the two coincide, in that a state has chosen to adopt and endorse a specific cultural group as associated with it. The concept of a nation-state can be compared and contrasted with that of the multinational state, city-state, empire, confederation, and any other state formations with which it might overlap. The key distinction here is the identification of a people with a polity in the nation state. The idea of the nation state actually developed fairly recently. Prior to the 1500s in Europe, the nation state as we know it did not exist. Back then, most people did not consider themselves part of a nation. They rarely left their village and knew little of the larger world. If anything, people were more likely to identify themselves with their regions or their local lord. At the same time, the rulers of states frequently had little control over their countries. Instead, local feudal lords had a great deal of power, and kings often had to depend on the goodwill of their subordinates in order to rule. Laws and practices also varied a great deal from one part of the country to another. As we are going to further develop in today's lecture, in the early modern era, especially in the 1500s, a number of monarchs began to consolidate power by weakening the feudal nobles and allying themselves with the emerging commercial classes. This difficult process sometimes required violence. The consolidation of power also took a long time. Kings and queens worked to bring all the people of their territories under one unified rule. Not surprisingly, then, the birth of the nation state also saw the first rumblings of nationalism, as monarchs encouraged their subjects to feel loyalty toward the newly established nations. The modern integrated nation state became clearly established in most of Europe during the 19th century or during the 1800s. But my friends, I haven't quite answered the question yet, have I? What is a nation state? Well, if we're studying international relations, a basic definition of what the relations are between in our study is foundational. In other words, if we're looking at international relations, what is international? What is national? We have to get that foundational definition under our belts first. Well, let's start then, perhaps a bit more formally. As I suggested a moment ago, there exists two theories in how a nation achieves statehood. First is the declarative theory of statehood, which defines a state as a person in international law if it meets the following criteria. One, it is a defined territory, a geographic territory. Two, it has a permanent population. Three, it has a government. And four, it has a capacity to enter into relations with other states. According to it, the entity statehood is independent of its recognition by other states. And as such, it has the right to declare war, contract alliances, and all other things that states may have right do. So they're establishing themselves as a nation state in the Declaration of Independence. And so that is a declarative theory of statehood. We are a state because we declare that we are. We say that we are. And other people's recognition of our sovereignty, of our statehood, is irrelevant. We are a state because we say we are one. The declarative theory. 
The next, then, is the constitutive theory of statehood, or a theory that defines a state as a person in international law if and only if it is recognized by, as sovereign by other states. This theory of recognition was developed in the 19th century or in the 1800s. A really good example was the rush of the British government through its prime minister, Palmerston, who first cut his teeth as foreign secretary under Queen Victoria, to recognize the Confederate States of America during the U.S. Civil War. Using this theory, a state was sovereign if another sovereign state recognized it as such. This theory explains why it's such a big deal for new states to achieve recognition by the more powerful nation states today. In this, I'm thinking of Taiwan, who the U.S. still doesn't recognize in fear of angering China, or perhaps of Israel and the rush for the United States to recognize when it was first established. What about the rush to recognize the former Soviet republics after the breakdown of the Soviet Union, especially what that meant if it might turn their interests and allegiances westward? So if the United States and Western Europe rushed to recognize the former Soviet socialist republics as independent sovereign states, according to the constitutive theory then, it worked. <laughs> it worked very well. And those former Soviet states did indeed turn westward, many of them joining NATO. Okay, my wonderful scholars. So while this isn't an intro to Western Civ class, <laughs> although it may feel like it, rather it's a survey class reviewing international relations. As I said, one must start somewhere as we seek to define what a nation is and how a nation evolved into a nation state. Much like our textbook author, Karen Minkst, I wrestled with the starting line of this lecture quite a bit, and I finally settled a little bit earlier than she did on the Athenian Empire, or the Greek Empire under Athens, the Athens city-state, the Athenian Empire. While surely earlier and as important empires and civilizations existed, just to name a few, the Egyptian, the Andean, the Cynic, the Minoan, the Sumerian, the Mayan, the Indic, uh, the Hittite, the Persian, the Arabic, the Hindu, the Yucatec, the Babylonic, all these other important established empires and civilizations don't quite match the importance of the Athenian Empire insofar as the flow of Hellenic ideals into the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire then into our medieval and Renaissance societies, which flow, as we know, into our societies today. The flow then of the Hellenic ideals to our point in time in the third decade of the 21st century is actually pretty straightforward. When I use the term Hellenic, H-E-L-L-E-N-I-C, Remember that Hellenic refers to the Greek. Furthermore, as there were significant civilizations in the East, such as the Cynic, the Hindu, and to some extent the Arabic and the Indic, as well as those from the South, as the Yucatec, the Mayan, and the Andean, it is the development of the nation state in Western Europe that has solidified as the universal model we now see, at least in the near unanimity, of the 206 states that currently exist. Some important Hellenic contributions that we see evidence today is, first and foremost, the centralization of authority. Centralization, or the process by which law and policymaking become centrally located, helped spur the development of nation states in later eras. Without going into too much mind-numbing detail, by 454 BCE, that which was called the Delian League could be fairly characterized as an Athenian empire because of one key event in that year, the moving of the treasury of the Delian League from Delos 
to Athens. They who have the money make the rules. The transfer of the treasury from Delos to Athens suggested the end of the Delian League and the true beginning of the Athenian Empire. This is often seen as a key marker of the transition from alliance to empire. To further strengthen Athens' grip on its empire, Pericles, in 450 BCE, began a policy of establishing quasi-colonies that remained tied centrally to Athens and which served as garrisons to maintain control of the League's vast territory. Furthermore, Pericles employed several offices to maintain Athens' control of the empire. The Proxenoi, who fostered good relations between Athens and the League members, the Episcopoi, who oversaw the collection of the tribute, and the Hellenotomai, who received the tribute, or the money, then, on Athens' behalf. Athens' empire was not very stable, and after 27 years of war, the Spartans, aided by the Persians, and abetted by Athenian internal strife, were able to defeat it. However, it didn't remain defeated for long. <laughs> the Second Athenian League, a maritime self-defense league, was founded in 377 BCE, and that was also led by Athens. But the Athenians could never quite recover the full extent of their power, and their enemies were now far stronger and more varied. So by 146 BCE, with Rome gaining total control of the former Greek Empire at the Battle of Corinth, the flow of Greek art, culture, philosophy, politics, and law flowed into the Roman Empire, and from thence, we shall see, into our own era. The Roman Empire was the post-Republican period of ancient Rome. What do we mean by that, and why is that important? We remember from our Roman history that Rome was at first a kingdom. From its founding, circa or around 753 BCE, thence to become a republic, from circa 509 BCE, when the Romans overthrew their Etruscan conquerors. Centered north of Rome, the Etruscans had ruled over the Romans for hundreds of years by virtue of a king. Once free from that king, the Romans established a republic. We know that a republic is a government in which citizens elect representatives to rule on their behalf. Res publica, R-E-S-P-U-B-L-I-C-A, res publica, the public thing, is the root of the word republic, again, in which citizens elect representatives to rule on their behalf but the authority then rests with the citizens. This Roman Republic lasted until 27 BCE when Caesar Augustus took power and kept going until 476 in the Common Era. I use Common Era instead of AD, Anno Domini, to match up with BCE, the before the Common Era, and not before Christ. So BC stands before Christ. BCE stands for before the common era. AD, the Latin for Anno Domini, or year of our Lord. CE, common era. So we go from, sorry, let me take that back. This republic then lasted until 27 BCE, when Caesar Augustus took power and kept going until roughly 476 CE. A polity, P-O-L-I-T-Y, polity, is a form or process of civil government or an organized society existing as a political entity. Well, as a polity, the Roman Empire, as shown in the map on this slide that pictures the greatest expanse of the Roman Empire at 176 CE, included large territorial holdings around the Mediterranean Sea in Europe, North Africa, and Western Asia. From the accession of Caesar Augustus to the military anarchy of the third century, 
it was a principate with Italy as metropole of the provinces and the city of Rome as the sole cosmopolitan capital. Wait a minute, wait, whoa, Mike, what, slow down, what? What is a principate? What is a metropole? And what do you mean by cosmopolitan? <laughs> All right, fair enough. It's important to define these terms today while we're laying our foundations because these words are coming back time and again in our discussions. So we should really get them down fair and square today. A principate, P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-T-E, a principate is a form of government where authority is invested in the worthiest citizen or the princeps, P-R-I-N-C-E-P-S, the princeps, who would beneficially guide his compeers and exemplify the ideal of the patriot statesman. A compeer, C-O-M-P-E-E-R, is simply a person of equal rank, status, or ability. In short, then, the princeps is a chief, or a first among equals. Now, this is not to be confused with a principality, or a prince, or a political organization headed by a prince. While they're somewhat related terms, in this instance, they have different derivations and different meanings. A metropole is the homeland of a colony. This is a metropole, M-E-T-R-O-P-O-L-E. -E. Metro comes from the original Greek, roughly meaning mother or a source of origin. And, well, since polis, P-O-L-I-S, means city, then metropole means mother state. So, we might correctly refer to Rome as being metropolitan as it's the central city, but we're also referring to its broader regions in relation to the empire. So it's more correctly called a metropole or a mother region or a mother state. To clarify, we use the term metropolitan today to refer to large centralized cities with significant suburban areas. For example, I like to think of the city of Los Angeles, which in itself has a population of 4 million people. But Los Angeles serves as the metropolis of the greater Los Angeles area, which holds 13 million people. And the metropolis of Los Angeles obviously commands an economic and social influence over the metropolitan area. But this metropolis then is not a metropole. So if we're looking at the Italian peninsula as the motherland of Rome and thus of the Roman Empire, then the Italian peninsula is the metropole of the empire. That being said, remember though that Italy as a nation state itself won't be created until after Italian unification in, in 1848. So please don't confuse what we call the Italic or the Apennine Peninsula, which is that boot that comes out into um, the Mediterranean that we're used to calling Italy with the Italic or the Apennine Peninsula of 176 AD with the country of Italy today. Italy didn't exist in 176 AD. Now, you may think I'm dancing, dancing on the head of the pin here, but it's really important to get used to these terms and to understand their definitions and to get them under our belts because as we progress in our studies, we're gonna see that term, metropole, used again and again with the British, the French, and the Portuguese empires to designate their European territories as opposed to their colonial or overseas territories. And if we're talking about international relations, especially as we come through the period of colonization, let's say from the 1500s to the end of the Second World War, 
the idea of metropole, metropolis, etc., are going to become very important. So we have to get those squared away today. Now, there was another term in there, cosmopolitan. Now, we're used to this term a little bit more, but what does it really mean? Well, being cosmopolitan simply means including or containing people from many different countries, regions, or areas around the world. Breaking it down then, cosmo, as in the cosmos, means universal. Pol, P-O-L, again, meaning the city. And so the cosmopolitan city would be the capital city of the world. I think that would be a fair translation of the word cosmopolitan, the capital city of the world. Rome, then, in 176 CE, certainly was the capital city of the world, at least the known world as they knew it at that time. Now, as far as cosmopolitan goes, please don't tell this to the folks who own the hotel in Las Vegas, because you'll just hurt their feelings. So where are we? All right. From the ascension of Caesar Augustus to the military anarchy of the 3rd century CE, the empire was a principate with Italy as metropole of the provinces and the city of Rome as the sole cosmopolitan capital. Ah, check, we got it. Although fragmented briefly during the military crisis, the empire was forcibly reassembled and then ruled by multiple emperors who shared rule over the vast Western Roman Empire and over the Eastern Roman Empire, known as the Byzantine Empire, founded in Byzantium, a city that will be later known as Constantinople and still later known today as Istanbul. Rome remained the nominal capital of both parts, the East and the West Empire, until 476 CE, when the imperial insignia, or the regalia that went along with the emperor, and so thus the empire, were sent from Ravenna and Milan to Constantinople. The fall of the Western Roman Empire to Germanic kings, along with the Hellenization of the Eastern Roman Empire into the Byzantine Empire conventionally marks the end of ancient Rome with the beginning of the Middle Age or the Middle Ages. Due to the Roman Empire's vast extent and long endurance, the institutions and culture of Rome had profound and lasting influence on the development of language, religion, art, architecture, philosophy, law, and forms of government in the territory it governed and truly far beyond. The Latin language of the Romans, as we know, evolved into the Romance languages of the medieval and the modern world while medieval Greek became the language of the Eastern Roman Empire. The empire's adoption of Christianity led to the formation of medieval Christendom. Greek and Roman art had a profound impact on the Italian Renaissance. Rome's architectural tradition served as the basis for Romanesque, Renaissance and neoclassical architecture and also had a strong influence on Islamic architecture. The corpus of Roman law or the body of Roman law has its descendants in many legal systems of the world today, such as the Napoleonic Code. While Rome's Republican institutions have left an enduring legacy, influencing the Italian city-state republics of the medieval period that we're going to be studying in great extent in a little bit, as well as the early United States and many other modern democratic republics. 
Remember that Rome, the empire, effectively devolved into the Roman Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church that will eventually find its way up Central Europe to Russia and to the Russian Orthodox Church. Throughout the medieval era, many multi-ethnic states emerged, some lasting just for a generation, while others would endure for centuries. It's important to get an idea of what the medieval empires were in order to understand how they lasted or how they failed and why, and what had influence to our understanding of international relations today. And so here is a good list of 20 empires from the Middle Ages, starting arguably perhaps with the most successful. First, let's talk about Byzantium from 330 to 1453 CE. Long after the western half of the Roman Empire had broken up, the eastern half, known as Byzantium, would continue to flourish. As I said, based out of the city of Constantinople, the empire would last actually for over a thousand years, although there were stretches when Byzantine fortunes were very weak. However, its endurance and its impact on medieval life make it rank for us the most successful empire in the Middle Ages. We also have the Mongol Empire from 1206 to 1368 CE. After uniting the Mongol people, Genghis Khan, who lived from about 1162 to 1227 CE, and his successors would use their military power to conquer state after state until by the mid 13th century, the Mongols would establish the largest contiguous land empire in history. However, the empire would soon break apart, forming powerful states in the Middle East and the Yuan Dynasty in China. Another important one is the Republic of Venice from 697 CE to 1797, called the Most Serene Republic of Venice. It began in a lagoon at the north end of the Adriatic Sea, but would make use of its maritime assets to become one of the most important economic powerhouses of the medieval world. The Venetians would take, take control of parts of the Italian peninsula, the Adriatic coast, also called the Dalmatian coast, Crete, and Cyprus, while setting up commercial posts in the western Mediterranean and in the Black Seas. We also have the Tang Dynasty from 618 to 907 CE. The period of the Tang Dynasty is regarded as one of the most prosperous times in Chinese history. With a population of about 50 million, rising to nearly 80 million at the end of the 9th century, the empire was able to build military forces that moved westward and conquered parts of Central Asia. Moreover, the dynasty became a leader in establishing economic, cultural, and technological innovation, greatly influencing its neighbors, especially Japan and Korea. The Ottoman Empire from 1299 to 1923. We're going to be talking a lot about this one. It would be the Ottomans that would bring an end to the Byzantine Empire and then establish in its place control over southeastern Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. The Ottoman Empire's greatest period would be the 15th and 16th centuries, but the state would continue to endure, although gradually declining, until the 19th century, until after World War I. You also have the Carolinian dynasty from 800 to 888 CE, with the reign of Charlemagne from 768 to 814, the Carolinian dynasty was pivotal in changing the map of medieval Europe. Much of the western half of the continent would fall under his rule, Charlemagne, 
Charles the Great. And on Christmas Day in the year 800, he was crowned emperor. However, his sons and grandsons would have trouble holding on to this vast empire, and before the end of the ninth century, it would split into what we now call France and Germany. Next, we have the Umayyad, Next, we have the Umayyad Caliphate from 661 to 750 CE, after Muaya ibn Abi Sufyan would become the ruler of the Muslim world and establish his own Umayyad dynasty based out of Damascus, his military forces would conquer large swaths of territory. At its height, the Umayyad Caliphate would extend from India to the Atlantic Ocean. However, as military successes subsided and the Islamic religion changed, the Umayyads were overthrown by, by the Abbasid Revolution. While a branch of the Umayyad family would continue to rule in Spain until the 11th century, the Abbasid Caliphate would represent the most prosperous period of Islamic civilization, although the state itself gradually became more decentralized. We have the first Bulgarian Empire from 681 to 1018. After the Bulgars settled in the Balkans in the 7th century, they would carve out for themselves a growing state that eventually would encompass much of southeastern Europe. Simeon I, from 893 to 927, would even assume the title Emperor of the Bulgarians and threaten to conquer Byzantium. A second Bulgarian Empire emerged in 1185 and would last for another 200 years before eventually being feated defeated by the Ottomans. And you may think I'm going crazy citing a seldom heard or seldom referenced empire, but the Bulgarian Empire and the evolution of the Baltic states are going to lead to the evolution of the nation state. Actually, they're going to be considered the first nation states, if you look at it academically, following World War I. So while the first Bulgarian state may not sound familiar to you, Trust me, we're going to be talking about it again. Next, you have the Crown of Aragon from 1137 to 1716. This Mediterranean maritime empire began in 1137 with the marriage of Raymond Berenger IV to Patrolina of Aragon, uniting the country of Barcelona and the kingdom of Aragon. Their descendants would continue to add states and principalities to their own personal rule so that by the later Middle Ages, they would have domain over the Balearic Islands, Sicily, Corsica, Sardinia, Malta, Southern Italy, and parts of Greece. The Mamluk Sultanate from 1250 to 1517, the Mamluks were slaves taken from parts of the steppe and Central Asia and trained to be the best military forces in the medieval world. Even after they overthrew the Ayyubid dynasty and took control of Egypt and Syria, they would continue to replenish their ranks and leadership with slaves. They were able to hold off repeated Mongol invasions, remove the Crusader states from the Eastern Mediterranean, and hold on to power for over 250 years. The Angevin Empire, from 1154 to 1214, saw Henry II amassing a series of titles during his reign. Oh my goodness, he was the Count of Anjou, he was the Count of Maine, the Count of Nantes, the Duke of Normandy, the Duke of Aquitaine, the Lord of Ireland, and King of England. Wow, that's a pretty big portfolio. While some lands he inherited, others he gained through marriage. Henry II seems to have been up to the task of maintaining and enhancing an empire that included almost half of France. The French king was surprised by what an active ruler Henry was, commenting, the king of England is now in Ireland, now in England, now in Normandy. He seems rather to fly than to go by horse or ship. Huh, indeed. However, family infighting and lackluster reigns by his sons 
Richard, and John would strip the Angevin Empire back down to the Kingdom of England. Now, Richard and John, we're going to remember from the folklore of Robin Hood, Richard the Lionhearted, and King John. Ah. The Holy Roman Empire from 962 to 1806. The 962, the German Otto I, reinstated that position of emperor. Remember Charlemagne? Fashioning himself as Charlemagne's successor. Although the empire theoretically extended from northern Italy to Austria, Germany, and the Low Countries, the Netherlands, and the present-day Czech Republic. It was a very decentralized state, with many of the city-states and principalities actually ruling themselves. The position of emperor was actually elected among the high-ranking families of the empire, which usually further limited its power. We'll be coming back to the Holy Roman Empire quite a bit later in this talk. The Fatimid Caliphate, from 909 to 1171, the Fatimids, an Ismaili Shia movement, had fled into northern Africa to escape Sunni persecution. With the help of the local Berber tribes, the Fatimid rulers were able to carve out a kingdom in what is present-day Algeria and Tunisia, so northern Africa on the Mediterranean. By the, by the year 969, they conquered Egypt and established Cairo as the capital of their caliphate. The empire would expand into the Red Sea and Syria, but began to decay in the late 11th century, challenged by Turks and Crusaders. Eventually, the military commanders Nur al-Din and his nephew Saladin would seize control of Egypt. The Hunnic Empire from 420 to 469. Around the year 420, the Hun brothers Akhtar and Ruglia began to establish a confederacy of nomadic tribes in the western half of the Great Steppe. The Hunnic Empire would reach its greatest strength under the rule of Attila, Attila the Hun, from 434 to 453, stretching out from Germany to Central Asia. Attila launched invasions of both the eastern and western portions of the Roman Empire and may have conquered Rome itself had he not died on his wedding night, <laughs> poor guy, with one account suggesting that it was from a severe nosebleed. Anyway, after his untimely death, the empire collapsed, but Attila the Hun and the Hunnic Empire, short-lived, is going to have a very profound effect on the establishment of our nation-state idea. Hun then is going to become the root of Hungarian or um, Hungary, Hungary and the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the Congress of Vienna and in the Treaty of Versailles are going to become very important. So we want to remember Attila the Hun and his nosebleed on his wedding night. Poor guy. The Timurid Empire from 1370 to 1507 saw the Turco-Mongol warlord Timur, also known as Tamerlane, begin his reign and his attempt to restore the Mongol Empire. He would take control of much of Central Asia, Iran, Iraq, and the Caucasus, and would even challenge the Ottomans and the Mamluks in the Middle East. However, after Timur's death in 1405, the empire he built up would decline and break up, with various Timurid emperors continuing to rule smaller states for the next few hundred years. And last but not least, we can't forget the North Sea Empire from 1016 to 1035. These are the Vikings, and the Viking ruler Newt earned the moniker of Newt the Great by becoming the kings of England, Denmark, and Norway. The historian Lawrence Larson commented, when the 11th century began its fourth decade, Newt was, with the single exception of the emperor, the most imposing ruler in Latin Christendom. After his death in 1135, each of the three kingdoms went their separate ways. But we can't forget the Vikings and Newt the Great and the North Sea Empire of 1016 to 1035. 
again, you'll have to please forgive me. I know this isn't a Western Civ survey class, and this this drum roll of empires may seem a bit off topic, but if you'll if you'll bear with me, you'll see how many of these names will come back time and again to inform our discussion of the rise of the nation state. And again, what we're doing in this lecture is we're defining nation state by looking at its historical evolution. Something that we touched on in our lecture, Introduction to International Relations, when I said that history and historiography were the first avenue of exploring and examining international relations, well, here we are. The Renaissance is an important event in European history that stretched from the 14th century to the 17th century. As we've been talking about, it was preceded by the Middle Ages in Europe and eventually led to other great events such as the Age of Enlightenment. In historical terms, the Renaissance is important because it led to a major shift in European thought and worldview. The Renaissance is considered to have begun in the city-states of the Italian peninsula, such as Genoa, Florence, Milan, Naples, Rome, and Venice. In each of these city-states, the significant changes of the overall Renaissance occurred and unfolded. For example, the most significant changes that emerged as a result of the Renaissance can be seen in European architecture, art, literature, mathematics, music, science, religion, philosophy, and politics. Intellectual thought in these fields flourished during the time frame of the Renaissance and led to many people questioning long-held beliefs about each of these areas. This created an environment of discovery and curiosity in which new ideas were constantly being introduced and tested. As well, European life before the start of the Renaissance was dominated by feudalism and the manor system. But, those, but these both played small roles for citizens in these powerful Italian city-states. As such, the major Italian city-states were well positioned to undergo the political and societal shift brought about by the new Renaissance ideas. Most of the changes that occurred in the Renaissance city-states were centered on Renaissance humanism. One of the main features of the Renaissance was the rediscovery of European thinkers of ancient Greece and Rome, their ideas and their texts. For example, even the term Renaissance in French means rebirth. This is in relation to the idea that the intellectual culture of the Renaissance was sparked by the rebirth or the rediscovery of these ancient philosophies and ideas which had largely been ignored in Europe throughout the Middle Ages. Harbingers of national unity appeared in the Treaty of the Italic League in 1454 and the 15th century foreign policy of Cosimo de' Medici and Lorenzo de' Medici those names may sound familiar, to whom Machiavelli dedicated his The Prince. Along with Machiavelli, other leading Renaissance Italian writers, such as Dante, Petrarch, Boccaccio, and Guiardinini, expressed opposition to foreign domination. Petrarch stated, that the agent valor in Italian hearts is not yet dead. Machiavelli later quoted four verses from Italia Mia in The Prince. Machiavelli later quoted four verses from Petrarch's Italia Mia in his work The Prince, which looked forward to a political leader who would unite Italy to free her from the barbarians. The ideal of a complex nation-state, one that possesses a central power and does not operate in a feudal manner or under control of the church, 
came into being during this rather turbulent period of political transition. The political realities of this era provided the gateway for thinkers to advocate change in how states act, how rulers rule, and the overall significance of the centralized nation state. From 1100 CE to about 1600 CE, the Western world experienced a plethora of challenges to the existing order of how political structures operate. These innumerable events, all of which ignited furious philosophical, social, moral, and political thought, eventually gave way to the paramount thinking of Niccolo Machiavelli. As I suggested, Machiavelli's work, The Prince, clearly outlines the problems with religious and feudal rule that were all too commonplace in Western societies and offers a tangible guidebook for leaders to look to for assistance in ruling. The Prince, which is essentially a realist doctrine, now realism being one of those terms that we're going to be coming back to countless times in this class, the Prince, which is essentially a realist doctrine, discusses how a ruler should acquire principalities, how he should act in times of war, how he should treat his subjects, and most importantly, how an ideal ruler can maximize his power and effectively rule a lasting and successful state. Machiavelli's fluctuating political life and his vocational experiences largely contributed to his thinking and intellectual basis for the ideals presented in The Prince. He had been consignilieri of Florence, yet witnessed the Medici subvert Florence's government for their own dynastic needs. As I suggested, prior to unification, Italy was a spread out territory consisting of these feudal city-states, perpetually engaged in conflict and often being subjected to attacks from outside powers. For example, in 494, the Milanese, or the people from the city of Milan, had invited the much more powerful French to intervene in Italian rivalries as Milan's ally. This eventually led to the Medici's surrendering Florence to their enemies without a fight, which then led to a popular uprising against the Medici regime. Florence's Republic was briefly restored, and it is these issues of power that frame Machiavelli's work, The Prince. The organization of the nation-state was a foreign concept to Italy. The size of Italian political organization was on a much smaller scale than that of the city-state, regardless if the form of government was a republic, an aristocracy, or an oligarchy. Machiavelli is primarily concerned with how a state can maintain its independence and how the ruler must act in order to remain in power. Italy became the pawn of larger nation-states, the site of an almost century of war between the French and the Spanish Habsburgs, lasting until the Treaty of Cambrai in 1559. Machiavelli's The Prince discusses the different types of principalities, classifying all of them as hereditary, new, mixed, or ecclesiastical, or run by the church. After establishing his definitions for each, he devotes much time to the ideal prince and the qualities such a prince must possess. In doing so, Machiavelli consistently uses historical examples to substantiate his arguments. Sound familiar? He looks to Greek and Roman political events, and also to the political instability of his day both within Italy and abroad, to strengthen his arguments and to provide tangible reference points for the reader to draw upon. The following passage regarding how a ruler maintains a colony 
clearly displays Machiavelli's use of furthering his ideas with the assistance of a then contemporary example. If the old territories and the new have similar customs, the new subjects will live quietly. Thus, Burgundy, Brittany, Gascony, and Normandy have for long quietly submitted to France. Although they do not speak exactly the same language, nevertheless their customs are similar, and they can easily put up with each other. One of Machiavelli's main focuses within the prince is his construction of the ideal ruler. He delves into the specific characteristics that will enable a ruler to flourish. Machiavelli begins writing specifically about the ideal ruler in his chapter 15. He says, the prince must possess the qualities that will secure the success of the state. In chapter 16, he devotes his writing to the qualities and overall generosity that the prince should possess. Pope Julius II, who we're going to talk about in a little bit, King Louis XII, and King Ferdinand of Spain are all then evaluated in the prince on the basis of their generosity. Additionally, an example from ancient Rome is utilized to validate Machiavelli's statements on the topic. Again, in chapter 16, he concludes briefly, so it is wiser to accept a reputation as miserly, which people despise but do not hate, than to aspire to a reputation as generous, and as a consequence, be obliged to face criticism, which people both despise and hate. <laughs> can't win, you can't lose. Each chapter follows this pattern of logical reasoning, and as previously noted, each statement is presented and then scrutinized in an historical context, much as we're doing today. Of these chapters describing the desirable qualities of a prince, the most striking deal with aspects of cruelty. Machiavelli's theory is that cruelty as an abstract quality, is, un is fundamentally undesirable. Yet, in practice, it can have its virtues. He asserts that while cruelty, for its own sake, is not admirable, cruelty employed by a wise ruler for the preservation of the state is warranted. This reasoning and why we're spending so much time focusing on Machiavelli is because it reinforces the overall notion that the well-being of the state always supersedes any other concerns the ruler may be dealing with. Similar statements are made throughout the prince concerning the deceit and duplicity a ruler must resort to if he plans on maintaining a functional state. Throughout the prince, any actions that facilitate the preservation of the state are looked upon favorably, while any conduct that jeopardizes it, however well-grounded in principle, must be avoided at all cost. Machiavelli's intended ideal ruler can easily be contrasted with the ideal ruler or the philosopher king that is presented within Plato's Republic. So both Plato and Machiavelli have a set vision of the ideal ruler. In both Plato's Calliopolis and Machiavelli's ideal principality, the supreme goal is some form of the common good. Plato's common good is maximizing the good for all citizens, while Machiavelli's is simply the conservation of the state institution, which in turn acts to protect the rights of the citizens. While these ideas are similar, Machiavelli and Plato offer radically different notions of the ideal leader within a given political structure. Machiavelli manifests such differences by stating, I am concerned it may be thought presumptuous for me to write on this as well, especially since I have to say, as regards to this question in particular, will differ greatly from the re recommendations of others. But 
My hope is to write a book that will be useful, at least to those who read it, intelligently. And so I thought it sensible to go straight to a discussion of how things are in real life, and not waste time with the discussion of an imaginary world. For many authors have constructed imaginary republics and principalities which have never existed in practice and never could for the gap between how people actually behave and how they ought to behave. That gap is so great that anyone who ignores everyday reality in order to live up to an ideal will soon discover he has taught how to destroy himself, not how to preserve himself. Many political trends that we have witnessed throughout both the present and the past can be seen within the prince. Machiavelli's attitudes toward colonization and imperialism can be applied to a multitude of events in recent times. The establishment of puppet states in conquered territories, as described in The Prince, can be easily related to the emergence of Cold War satellite states. The conception of well-used cruelty to further the goals of the state can also be related to perhaps the most notorious tyrants in modern history, from Stalin's purges to Mao's Cultural Revolution, Machiavelli almost prophesized, and his words are so far-reaching, universal, and easily identifiable. In addition to Machiavelli's The Prince, other texts were born out of similar settings, circumstances, and attitudes toward the existing system of rule. Outside of Italy, many similar socio-political events and the responses to them were slowly bringing in a set of renewed ideas that led to the intellectual basis for the conception of a strong nation state. During this period, France witnessed significant religious strife between the Catholics and the Protestant Huguenot. In effect, the existing French monarchy was nearly torn apart by civil war between these two factions of competing noble families. These events led French philosopher and lawyer Jean Baudin to address the destructive nature of the Huguenot Wars in his defining work, Six Books on the Common Wheel, in 1576. In this, Baudin wrote that in order for a strong state to survive, a sovereign monarchy was imperative. Hmm. Bowden advocates that the monarch must possess a monopoly on power to defend and maintain the state, while still respecting the individual rights of his subjects. Even though France had begun as one of the early nation-states, it was not until the monarch could prevent unruly nobles from fighting against each other and the interests of the central government could nation-states really be considered developed. Huh. So Bowdoin's conception of sovereignty, the definitive authority to rule within a given political system, furthered the overall strengthening of the nation-state. Machiavelli's Prince was born out of an era of widespread political turmoil. His ideas presented within drew heavily from the failures of the past and his present, yet in turn led to a hauntingly real vision of the future role of political structures. Machiavelli's thought provided the blueprint for the modern-day nation-state. Subsequent thinkers, such as Jean Baudin, added to Machiavelli's model of change from existing reliance on feudal, religious, and local governments to that of a strong nation-state. Prior to the 16th century, feudalism dominated the European landscape. Noble lords ruled over the serfs or tenants who worked the lands of their large estates. Their lords, in turn, paid tribute and swore oaths of loyalty to the monarchs who granted them their manors or fiefs. Very few people 
would have identified themselves as citizens of a nation prior to the 16th century. Their loyalties were far more individualized. They might be subjects of a king, or dependents of a noble lord, or they might be residents of a city or a village. In any case, their focus tended to remain fixed on their local community and the individuals who governed that, not as a collective ideal. There were some people, however, who did dream of unity in Europe. These ambitious men and some women wanted to somehow gather up all the fiefs, all the lords, all the serfs, and all the little towns into one big dynasty. For centuries, the Roman Catholic Church was the focal point of this dream, in which the church and secular rulers would work together to peacefully preserve, teach, and spread the Christian faith. As I said when I opened this lecture, this was one of my favorites to write, and I've been having great fun the last few weeks doing all the research and, and reminding myself of all these marvelous anecdotes. I've especially been long interested in the first half of the 16th century, or 1500 to maybe 1550, because, as I jokingly suggest, there must have been something in the water. <laughs> in a 50-year period, six men who I, I really call titans, held the major thrones of Europe. And their collectivization of power, both temporally and spiritually, is actually a huge demarcation in the evolution toward the nation state, what we're studying today. This centralization allowed for a worldwide era of colonization and conquest in the latter part of the 16th century and paved the way for rapid economic growth in Europe. Many historians argue that it were these key characters, these titans, who made it possible and indeed made necessary the formulation of strong central governments in order to maintain and to maximize military strength that would enable conquest or prevent being conquered. So of these titans, I'm going to introduce you to them one at a time. Our first is Henry VIII. Ah, Henry VIII, who sat on the throne of England from 1509 to 1547. We're all very familiar with the image of Henry VIII, right? That history is, has handed down to us. You may picture perhaps a rather well, big frame guy chomping on a turkey drumstick, right, throwing it over his shoulder. I know I do when I think of Henry VIII. That, that image, I don't know if it's from Bewitched or whatever, but it always comes to mind. Henry's reign was truly a watershed in English political history. There's an amazing photograph of Jonathan Rise Myers, you know, who played Henry VIII in the Showtime series, The Tudors, okay? I know this is pop culture, but bear with me. This photograph shows this young man, handsome, athletic, Henry as he was in his youth, holding in one hand a sword and a crucifix in the other. That's it. That's my best image of Henry VIII because it encapsulates why he's so important to our studies. To the mind of many, Henry's tumultuous rule stripped corrupt Catholicism of power and wealth in favor of England's sovereign church and her free people. In reality, however, the break with Rome and the dissolution of the monasteries in England eliminated key pillars of resistance against the forces of nationalism, absolutism, and capitalism. So as such, this key historical moment holds important lessons for religion, politics, economics, and the rise of the nation state today. When Henry broke England away from the Church of Rome, it ceased to be part of a huge medieval cross-channel European empire and instead became 
an independent, sovereign nation-state free from the authority of any foreign potentate. Above all, the Pope. And so we remember our core definition of sovereignty, that all power resides in this person, in this people, in this crown, all power. And so when I say that breaking with the Church of Rome started the creation of the independent sovereign nation state in England was because it came free from the authority of that foreign potentate, the influence or the direction of that potentate, the Pope. Do you follow? So if you ever wondered about the origins of what we call English Euroscepticism, lately reflected in Brexit, or the process by which the British are leaving the European Union, really, my friends, we have no further to look than this Protestant Reformation and Henry VIII's breaking with the Church of Rome. The violent dissolution of the monasteries in the second half of the 1530s consolidated monarchical absolutism and created the conditions for capitalism. By handing over expropriated lands to barons in exchange for their political support, Henry did not simply reinforce the crown vis-a-vis -vis the church. He also weakened and destroyed the network of local monastic orders, which, since the Norman Conquest in 1066, had helped create and uphold the complex space of intermediary associations that tended to diffuse central power and mediate between individuals and the state, including localities, guilds, and agrarian communities. So by eliminating the monasteries and cutting ties with the papacy, Henry established a monarchical power that commanded unprecedented fiscal control, and military might, which was the basis for his foreign policy adventurism, which seeked to further isolate England from the rest of Europe. Critically, the dissolution of the monasteries under Henry VIII redistributed one quarter of national wealth at the expense of the peasantry the endowment of monasteries, including landed property, was transferred to the newly created Court of Augmentations, an early modern precursor of governmental organizations charged with overseeing monastic expropriation. In other words, what do we do with all this land? What do we do with all this money? Originally, it was applied to education and applied to the building of universities, yeah, originally. But the triple effect was to curb the social and educational functions of the monastic orders, to channel wealth and income to the crown, and to, con and to concentrate land ownership in the hands of the nobility, the local magnates, and the newly landed gentry. Henry VIII always looms largely in English life, and to read of his contemporary in France gives you a completely different perspective on European history. So Henry VIII's main rival in France was Francis I, who reigned in France from 1515 to 1547. Francis saw himself as the first truly Renaissance king, a man who was the exemplar of courtly and civilized behavior throughout France and Europe. He was a courageous and an heroic warrior. He was an accomplished diplomat and an energetic ruler who transformed his country to be a force to be reckoned with. But he was also capricious, vain, and arrogant, taking hugely unnecessary risks, 
at least one of which nearly resulted in the end of his kingdom. His great feud, not only with Henry VIII, but with his arch-nemesis, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, defined European diplomacy and sovereignty. But his notorious alliance with the great Ottoman ruler Suleiman threatened to destroy everything. He was the king that his country needed, if not the one that it might have wished for. <laughs> in an age in which European relations were characterized by the emergence of great nations from small independent states, Francis I's forthright attitudes toward the expansion of French territories overseas came at precisely the right time. If his people had had an ambivalent attitude toward their king, especially later in his reign, greater civil disobedience was checked by the knowledge that he acted both in their interests and his own, which he considered one and the same. An intriguingly magnetic and contradictory figure emerges from a modern assessment of Francis I. Perhaps the best point of comparison is with, as I suggest, his contemporary and an occasional ally, occasional nemesis, Henry VIII. <laughs> Both men occupied this important symbolic position in their country's history, but for entirely different reasons. Well, Henry's influence was a destructive one. Francis furthered the glory of his kingdom, as Henry posed as a Renaissance man that was without substance, Francis devoted his time and energy to the arts and to creativity. As men, their differences were as striking as their similarities. Without Francis I, there can be little doubt that his country would have risked taking a different and far less modern direction. He prevented the hegemony of Charles V, the Holy Roman Empire, over the continent and reshaped territorial boundaries in a way that his successor and son, Henry II, would ultimately consolidate. Perhaps the most appropriate description of Francis, then, is as much the maker of modern Europe as he was the maker of modern France. And we need to remember, too, that um, Charles V, as we'll see, the Holy Roman Emperor, was the nephew of Catherine of Aragon, who was Henry VIII's first wife. Ah, it's a small world. Our next titan under examination is Pope Julius II, who reigned from 1503 to 1513. Julius viewed as the main task of his pontificate, his time as Pope, to be the restoration of the Papal States, in other words, the temporal Papal States, which had been reduced to ruin by the Borgias. Large portions of it, of the land under his rule, had been appropriated by Venice after the death of Pope Alexander VI. As a first step as Pope, Julia subjugated Perugia and Bologna in the autumn of 1508. Then in 1509, he joined the League of Cambrai, an anti-Venetian alliance formed in December of 1508 between Louis XII, who then ruled Milan, Emperor Maximilian I, and Ferdinand II of Spain, who had been King of Naples as well since 1503. This league, then, this alliance between the Pope, Spain, the Holy Roman Emperor, the League troops defeated Venice in May of 1509 near Cremona, and the Papal States were restored. Julius II got his wish. Having become an exponent of Italian national consciousness, Julius II proposed to drive the French from Italy completely, but his second war, which lasted from 1510 to 1511, was unsuccessful. Several of his cardinals defected to Louis XII and called a schismatic council, to which Julius responded 
by summoning the Fifth Lateran Council. After concluding an alliance <laughs> with Venice and Ferdinand II of Spain and Naples in October of 1511, Julius then opened the council in 1512 at the Lateran Palace in Rome. Louis XII had defeated the troops of the, of the alliance at Ravenna in April of 1512, but the situation changed when Swiss troops <laughs> were sent to the Pope's aid. The territories in northern Italy occupied by the French revolted. The French did indeed leave the country, and the Papal States were augmented by the acquisition of Parma. Toward the end of his life, he viewed with concern the replacement of French by Spanish efforts to attain supremacy in Italy. We tend to think of popes today in the third decade of the 21st century as simply spiritual leaders. But we remember that in the 1500s, in the early 16th century, the popes were not only spiritual leaders, but temporal leaders. They were heads of armies. They were makers of war and of alliances. And so we remember this when, when bearing to mind Julius II, then as one of our titans, who was seeking to unify the Apennine Peninsula, Italy, by getting rid of foreign influences, the French and the Spanish. By 1519, when Charles V became emperor, the Holy Roman Empire was already an ancient institution in existence since 800 CE when Charlemagne was crowned emperor by the Pope. In the early 16th century, the Holy Roman Empire consisted of over 300 separate principalities, duchies, free imperial cities, and other territories ruled by dukes, counts, princes, archbishops, bishops, city councils, imperial knights, and, and a myriad of others. These covered a large area of Central Europe. At its greatest extent, it included most of the modern states of Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, the Netherlands, Belgium, Northern Italy, excluding Venice, Western Poland, and Eastern France, such as Alsace-Lorraine, as Savoy. Mm. Such were the divisions and complexity of the territories that many ruling princes had to cross their neighbor's land to visit outlying portions of their own. Again, to clarify our terms, the Holy Roman Emperor was used to signify the elected head of the Holy Roman Empire. There were seven electors the Archbishops of Mainz, Trier, and Cologne, the King of Bohemia, and three secular princes, the electors of Brandenburg, Saxony, and the Palatinate. Those elected became, quote, King of the Romans, until such time they were crowned by the Pope, at which point they became the Emperor of the Romans, or the Holy Roman Emperor. We'll have great fun in a future lecture when I talk about tomb art as political and cultural representation, when we refer to Maria Theresa of Austria and her ability to acquire the title Holy Roman Emperor because there was no such thing as a Holy Roman Empress, because <laughs> one had to take holy orders as a priest before one could become Holy Roman Emperor, and one could not become a priest if one were a woman. Therefore, ergo, a woman could not become Holy Roman Emperor. But I digress. Charles's grandfather and his predecessor, Maximilian, had been prevented from going to Rome for his coronation. And so Pope Julius II, we know him, gave Maximilian the title Emperor-elect of the Romans. Huh. From then on, those elected were called emperor, 
and if during their lifetime a successor was chosen, that that heir designate was given the title the King of the Romans. The other contenders for the imperial throne at the time of Charles V were, oh, that's right, Francis I of France <laughs> and Henry VIII of England. Francis certainly had serious hopes in becoming the Holy Roman Emperor and was initially encouraged by Pope Julius II and by some of the electors thinking that he would actually take the throne. But by the time of Charles V's ascension to the imperial throne, the power of the emperor was in decline with ongoing conflict about the degree of influence and access to the resources of the territories that the emperor should have had. Each territory aspired to as much independence as possible and the more powerful princes were steadily gaining authority. But most were also keen to have the strength that association brought against external enemies. So they wanted independence, but they also wanted association or alliances to protect themselves. So the emperor was acknowledged, sure, as the supreme judge in law, and he had the right to bestow titles and decide on issues for discussion at the Diets, D-I-E-T-S, the Diets, which were formal meetings of the rulers within the empire, divided into the three estates of the rulers, or the electors. But he also had the obligation to uphold ancient rights and protect the empire from foreign aggression. But this was in no way a modern state, as we know it today, with the central government. As princes of the empire themselves, the Habsburgs, who held the title of emperor from 1438 to the end of the empire in 1806, with one short exception in the mid-18th century, were at times in conflict over territory with other German princes. There was no permanent army, no established system of imperial taxation, and really no effective means of enforcing the decisions that were made at the Diets. Charles had no doubt that it was his duty to take on the role. In his latter years, his grandfather, Emperor Maximilian, had been working hard to have Charles elected King of the Romans, his automatic successor. Maximilian well understood that this would be achieved not by promises alone, <laughs> but by hard cash. But he had not achieved his aim by the time of his death in January 1519. This meant that Charles would have to be elected in a more open contest since any commitments made by the electors to Maximilian, however expensive to the aging empire, emperor, were now null and void. Ah. Charles fought continually with the Ottoman Empire and its sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent. Well, we'll be talking about Suleiman a lot. The defeat of Hungary at the, Ma at the Battle of Mohacs in 1526 sent a wave of terror over Europe. The Muslim advance in Central Europe was halted at the Siege of Vienna in 1529. Suleiman the Magnificent had won the contest for mastery in the Mediterranean in spite of Spanish victories, such as the conquest of Tunis in 1535. The regular Ottoman fleet came to dominate the Eastern Mediterranean after its victories at Preveza in 1538 and Djerba in 1560 shortly after Charles's death, which severely decimated the Spanish marine arm. At the same time, the Muslim Barbary Corsairs, ships acting under the general authority and supervision of the Sultan, regularly devastated the Spanish and Italian coasts, crippling Spanish trade and chipping at the foundations of this Habsburg power. In 1536, Francis I of France allied himself with Suleiman against Charles V. While Francis was persuaded to sign a peace treaty in 1538, he again allied himself with the Ottomans in 1542 in a Franco-Ottoman alliance. In 1543, Charles allied himself with, oh yeah, Henry VIII <laughs> and forced Francis I to sign the truce of Crepe-en-Loin. 
Later, in 1547, Charles signed a humiliating treaty with the Ottomans to gain himself some respite from the huge expenses of their war. Oh my goodness, so who is this Suleiman that we speak of? Oh my goodness, well, Suleiman the Magnificent was the Ottoman Sultan from 1520 to 1566 and the last of our Titans. He's also known as the Lawgiver. He is often revered as one of the greatest Ottoman rulers because the empire reached its peak of political and military power when he was Sultan. During his reign, the state ruled over anywhere between 15 and 25 million people. Despite his many achievements, there is a school of thought which suggests that Suleiman the Magnificent is a bit overrated. Well, let's take a look at three areas where he seemingly excelled. Suleiman became Sultan in September of 1520, when his father, Selim I, died. Although Suleiman was 26 years of age by the time he took the throne, he was the first Ottoman Sultan to rule without having any prior military experience. During Selim's campaigns in the east, he left Suleiman behind to govern Istanbul. Also, his viziers were all experienced men, so if he showed any weakness, his position would have been under threat. Suleiman responded by launching a series of initially successful campaigns. Suleiman set his sights on the capture of Belgrade, something his grandfather, Mehmed II, failed to achieve. By capturing the city from the Kingdom of Hungary, the Ottomans could remove the threat of the Hungarians and the Croats. They were the main obstacle in the path of further Ottoman expansion into Europe because the Bulgarians, the Byzantines, the Serbs, the Albanians, and the Bosniaks had already been defeated. Suleiman surrounded Belgrade and captured the city in August of 1521. The next step was to conquer the eastern Mediterranean Isle of, island of Rhodes. In 1522, he set sail with about 100,000 men and captured the islands after a five-month siege. But one of his greatest victories, as I've already alluded to, came at the Battle of Mohawks on August 29, 1526. Suleiman's army defeated the Hungarians, who were led by King Louis II. The Ottoman army of up to 70,000 lost just 1,500 men compared to 20,000 dead on the Hungarian side. So the Ottoman Empire then is reaching up the Balkans, reaching up along the Adriatic Sea, up the Dalmatian coast, up through the Balkans, coming up then into Central Europe. And it's reaching now up past into Hungary, where it's finally going to land outside of Buda. Buda being one half of the city that's going to eventually become Budapest, uh, the current day capital of Hungary. After taking Buda, in 1529, Suleiman was unsuccessful in his further expansion, the conquest of Vienna, Austria, in the same year, and he was forced to raise, raise or to quit his siege. Further campaigns in Hungary between 1521 and 1543 led to the partition of Hungary between the Ottomans, the Principality of Transylvania, which is effectively East Hungary, and the Habsburg monar monarchy, which be effectively Western Hungary, that part that is more closer to Vienna. Poor Suleiman was in the midst of a campaign against Austria when he died outside of Sitzvar in Hungary on September 6, 1566. During his reign, the Ottoman territory doubled, and the empire was in exceptional shape. It was thriving in an economic sense, and its army was feared throughout Europe. French raison d'etat was deeply intertwined with the nation's tradition of divine absolutism. 
For Cardinal Richelieu, who was foreign secretary under French King Louis the Thirteenth from 1624 to 1642, and his absolutist fellow travelers, monarchy was not only the most effective form of government, it was also the most natural. The French monarch, by virtue of his divine nature, was infused with a purer, higher form of reason, which allowed him to pursue a more pragmatic foreign policy at a remove or a distance from the unruly passions and parochial concerns of the common man. This view of the king as the metaphysical embodiment of the state is evident throughout the works of Richelieu's closest collaborators, with one of them writing that the king was so divinely animated by the power of reason that the interests of the state had replaced the passions of his own soul. At the same time, however, the corporeal structure of the state, its territorial integrity, its armies and its institutions, remained <laughs> profoundly mortal. Its defense could only guaranteed by small trusted group of icy veined custodians mounting an undying and unforgiving vigil. Richelieu thus warned that Christian charity could hardly be extended to seditious actors, for while man's salvation occurs ultimately in the next world, states have no being after this world. Their salvation is either in the present or is non-existent. Hence, the punishments that are necessary to their survival may not be postponed, but must be immediate. Indeed, raison d'etat was also inherently authoritarian. French raison d'etat theorists were not just ruthless, they were also elitists. Convinced that the arcana imperiae, or the mysteries of the state, could only be mastered and entrusted to a select few. Having witnessed mob violence and religious cleansing on an horrific scale over the course of the last century, thinkers such as Richelieu were ever wary of the fickleness of the nation's subjects. Ordinary men and women who could fall prey to demagoguery and who, in their minds, were incapable of rising above their petty needs and brutish impulses in order to pursue a greater good. This paternalistic and imperious view of how a nation's grand strategy should be conducted undergirds the infamous passage in which Richelieu compares the common people to stubborn mules, requiring a careful mixture of cajolement and discipline. Richelieu's seeming dismissal of the everyday concerns of the French peasantry went hand in hand with a determination to impose order both at home and abroad, regardless of temporary hardship or foreign opposition. This single-mindedness was more than just a sign of a merciless operator, however. Although the chief minister was suffused with the pessimism and misanthropy characteristic of authoritarian thinkers, his vision for the future of French and European foreign policy was also strangely optimistic and, some might argue, enlightened for his age. As both statesman and churchman, Richelieu was the acknowledged architect of France's greatness in the 17th century and a contributor to the secularization of international politics during the Thirty Years' War that, as we're going to see, is going to culminate in the Treaty of Westphalia, our next segment of study. While in detail he was only moderately successful, Richelieu, in substance, attained his goals of orderly government under the royal authority and the defeat 
of Habsburg hegemony. Whether the centrifugal forces in Germany that he promoted and which the Peace of Westphalia institutionalized were advantageous to Europe in the long run is questionable, but the political fragmentation of the empire and the military eclipse of Spain made possible the grandeur of France that Richelieu foresaw and his successors realized. This mystical aspect of his design is difficult to articulate, but it is essential to his greatness. The conspiracies that erupted under his successor, Cardinal Mazarin, failed as much because Richelieu had wrought a fundamental psychological change in favor of the moral ascendancy of the crown as because, by the destruction of castles and city walls and the centralization of military authority, he had eliminated the power base of both aristocratic and religious descent.